ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for the workshop. Um, I was just speaking to Gavin before we went live with this, saying that it'd be very interesting to see how some of the ideas that Michael Schwab has raised play out. To all intents and purposes, uh, Michael, myself, Carolina have been talking, relatively speaking, to the abstractions of practice-based research, by which I mean the theoretical paradigms, how we understand the context, how we engage with the context. Now, Gavin Wade, as many of you will know, is the artist curator at Eastside Projects and a senior research fellow at Birmingham City University. Anybody who knows Eastside Projects will know that the application of precisely these concerns, these discourses, these practices within a social setting has been absolutely core to the curatorial practice and indeed institutional practice of East Side Projects, as long as I've known it. And I have had the pleasure of knowing East Side Projects for over a decade now. And indeed, I've had the pleasure of knowing Gavin for almost the same amount of time. Now, I'm not going to read out Gavin's entire bio. It is there, we can drop it into the uh, chat bar. It will save us some time. But I do want to emphasize that this is a very specific institution with a very specific remit that has been expanded upon over time. I myself am personally engaged with it through a number of initiatives that we organized through Birmingham City University, including Art Activisms, which is our research cluster. And I'd like to thank Gavin for hosting us uh, for quite a number of those workshop seminars. But one of the things we consistently come back to is what are the realities, what are the real world impacts of what can often be abstract and indeed over theorized ideas. So I'm going to pass over to Gavin. Uh, he will be talking for, I would think, Gavin, between 30 and 45 minutes, enabling us to have some Q&A towards the end. And hopefully our audience today, Gavin, will uh, indeed ask questions. If anybody has a question ongoing, do drop it into the chat bar and we will come back to it. Gavin, sir, I am passing over to you. Cool. All right. Thanks, Anthony. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, yeah, I thought I'd start you off with, uh, with Eastside Projects' Code of Conduct, which is posted up outside our front door as you come into the building. And as you notice here, it says that everyone is welcome. And by choosing to step over our threshold, you agree to act by this Code of Conduct. So we, de we demand that anyone entering the space respects each other, they be active, they don't assume, they check their privileges, um, they are open and also to be kind. And I think that's it sort of aimed at ourselves as a, as a staff team, but also about artists that we work with, partnership organizations and collaborators. And we think that people who come in to experience whatever is happening in Eastside projects are also part of that collaborative group. So um, it, it's, an, it's a recent one that we, we made the Code of Conduct uh, in 2020 during lockdown and we we made it um when we reopened i think in in october after the um the lockdown so I, that's sort of good to give a kind of starting point i'm just seeing if i can actually move my screen hold on a sec hmm. well, maybe i can't oh here we go okay it's moving slowly i'm going to try i'm going to Trying, I'm actually going to cover quite a lot of time and focus on a few key moments of um, methodologies, users' manuals, and, and in a way the application of some of the ideas that are generated through the process of being an artist curator and of running an artist-run multiverse, which is what we call Eastside Projects now. And to do that, I just want to step back in time here, this is back to 2001 and an idea of artists working together and coming up with, similar to a code of conduct, you know, agreeing on how we might work together as the basis for, for a project. This is myself and Goshka McHugh and Pera Hutner in 2001 and we're, uh, we're, we're swapping ideas and we're sharing ideas with each other and making an agreement that we will also now make an artwork based on each person's idea. Um, and so the, the, the exhibition was called Three in One. And what I, what I really want to show is just that the period through 1997 to 2001, 2002, I was, I was working as an artist curator 
um, developing what I called support structures for other artists. Um, and I would make walls, ramps, platforms, seating, uh, rooms for other artists to have to place and position their work onto, work in and around, sleep in sometimes. This image is from the three-in-one show with Pear and Goshka. And it's, um, it's a support structure that I made for three Brancusi sculptures, which exist in the uh, Philadelphia Museum collection. Uh, and which I had, did subsequently request and try and get them, the Brancusis to be placed onto it, which still haven't succeeded. But, but this structure, the artwork is owned by a collection in Philadelphia. So I still hope that at one point we can actually get three Brancusi um, sleeping head sculptures on, onto this, this form. But a, as a practice, that was, you know, that was, that was coming out of, of um, I, I started calling myself an artist curator in 96. And I think from 97 started developing um, a more precise and um, long-term exploration of ideas of support, which were, which were picked up and expanded greatly in 2002, that I, I realized that I had um, what I thought were interesting ideas to find out, and I wanted to expand the input into those. So it wasn't only me producing a structure for somebody else whether they're alive or dead or knowing or unknowing. Um, so I also did make support structures for unknown artworks, for, for example. Um, and in 2002, there was, um, there was a grant that was made uh, available from RSA that was called the RSA Art for Architecture Award, which I think was a really interesting and useful type of award, which would be great to bring that, that back because it effectively paid an artist to collaborate with an architect. So I, I was looking for an architect who I felt a connection and affinity with who would understand uh, my interest in the idea of art as a support for somebody else and art to be completed by collaboration with somebody else. And that that in a way was a fundamental aspect of being an artist curator. And uh, I met Celine Condorelli who had trained as an architect and was still practicing as an architect and but still an architect who trod into the world of art in, in quite a, an easy and direct way and very questioning way and we we pitched uh, so I, I sort of approached Celine and, and with the idea of I have this we have this support structure potential here how can we develop this how can we expand upon this and create um, a manifesto of how we should move forward. How can we create a sequence of projects that would expand on what the idea of support can mean within um, art processes? And also, I think uh, the term support structure now um, is very is very available and part of conversations all the time. In two thousand and one and two thousand and two, it was not. It was something that was not mentioned. It wasn't discussed. It wasn't. It wasn't there. It was something to pitch in. So it was um, an idea which I think caught the imagination of funders and other galleries and other organisations and other artists who wanted to take part in that. Um, so Celine and I set out on an adventure, I suppose, that we, um, we thought that we, we could explore this. And I'm going to show you how we, partly how we developed a very basic me methodology um, but I thought we'd read through this in a way, just to give you a sense of what the language of how we were talking about it. So su support structure will manifest a process of adaptation and development in relation to a series of different entities and sites. Support structure is universal, but never generic. Each application is specific to a particular situation. Each output will generate a different result. And through a cumulative process, will also con 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 contain a process of translation. Support structure is not an exhibition, but can be used as a tool to translate and facilitate the idea of exhibiting. So, which was us reflecting on and trying to understand what it was that we wanted to do, and an idea in a sense that we as a collaborative force were were taking on an idea of being a support structure. And some of that process led to physical, uh, very pragmatic 
and useful architectural forms and spaces. So this was an exhibition to have 30 exhibitions in 30 days curated by 30 members of the public. And each of the A, B, C, D, E, F boxes contained a set of artworks, maybe about 300 artworks that had been collected from around the world by the artist Per Huttner. Um, and this was the first iteration of support structure. Um, and it was to be able to, uh, part of it was that the idea that you could bring in a member of the public to come and curate a show and that they would be a curator by just stepping into the room um, and saying I'm a curator. It was to actually make sure that, that if that was done and if that is possible, it's done with um, more support for that process. So that if you walked into a room and just think by selecting artworks, you were being a curator, we didn't want you to fall into that trap to believe that that was possible. We wanted you to have to deal with a very large structure, which would, which would force you to question, how do I arrange the physicality of this room? And who has created these conditions in which I'm now going to be a curator? So we tried to make a structure which programmed that into the action. Without having to describe it, we just made a physical form that required it. It was unavoidable, impossible to ignore this massive structure in the middle of the room that contained artworks and would reshape that space. And we began to map out historical positions. Uh, this is um, Lily Reich and uh, Mies van der Rohe's Silk and Velvet Cafe. And, uh, and, and apply that to different places. And we set up a very simple um, routine for ourselves that was like over a period of two or three years, we would move out of the art world into other types of organizations and spaces that weren't really connected to the art world anymore. And we would apply the learning from one project to the next and apply it and to develop a methodology through the process. So this was The Economist plaza which was the second site which was a you know wasn't designed to be a space for art but had been co-opted for exhibitions across this period of time and we we wanted to not really make it a gallery space but to turn it back into a working office space we thought it wasn't really it wasn't really a useful idea to make it a gallery it was a more useful idea to look at what the site itself already meant and implied about society and about the way that you develop cities. Um, so this is, just, I mean, it's a super brief little insight. Uh, so that says, what is multicultural? And that was uh, yeah, phase three. So we, called, we did six phases at the start is what we pitched as the idea of support structure. Um, and it, this was with the uh, multicultural group in Portsmouth that I had met through curating another project with another artist in Portsmouth Cathedral the year before and, and met some really interesting people. And so it, it just led to very um, natural progressions of things. Suddenly I could bring funds and our skills to an organization and, and ask them how we might support them. So I'm just gonna skip through. Um, and in, in that case, we actually, developed a, a multicultural archive through a public call across the city with them and developed um, a new shape for their multicultural festival. So the, the outcomes were incredibly varied, very, very different, very responsive to what we, were, what we came across. Um, so we were, we were informed by um, uh, things like artist placement group. And uh, in the years prior to meeting up with Celine, I had been meeting with John Latham and Barbara Stavini and learning from them and writing and developing ideas that came out of that. So that, those, that sort of approach to an idea of an incidental person, of studies, of feasibilities, of propositions, of how you fit into other systems um, with, with, with a lightness, I suppose, and how you can alter other systems or not. Uh, and the power plays that come into that fed into support structure. So um, uh, Celine worked on producing the big book that captured all of our all of our work together. I mean, elements of it which are probably are more research focused, and elements which are very much documentation of of practice and art processes. So th for the, for the book, we decided to use um, the met our, our methodology that we had developed, so that offer support 
is the first stage of our methodology and that becomes the first chapter. And the second stage is to find a brief and then ask a question and pursue conversation. So I'm, I'm just gonna flick through some of those and have a look at, at, that, at that process. So, um, and, and just to, to think about what that, what that means as a process, because it can become something like a chapter organizing system for the way that you um, produce and design a book. Or it can become, uh, we actually proposed the methodology as a working practice to the multicultural group in Portsmouth. So things that we were producing for ourselves, we would try and offer to other organizations. Um, so I'm just gonna run through it really, really quickly. And you know, you could spend a lot of time on this. I'm, I'm not really planning to, but I think you could, if you wanna ask any specific questions, there's a lot that's to come out of it. So, but one of, so the key point for us that we discovered was if we verbally or sometimes in writing offered our support as an artist curator and an architect artist, we offered our support. We said, what, what do you think that we could do for you? And beyond that, in a way, what do you need support for? And we, we, uh, we offered that to, whether it was the Chisholm Hale, whether it was the Economist Plaza, whether it was the Portsmouth um, uh, Multicultural Group, whether it was the, uh, the council around Greenham Common was the next site that, that we went to. We would, we would just ask that question and tr try to get a response from them. Like, tell us, what is it that you think you need supporting? And that is, still feels a very, very, very simple <laughs> way to engage someone. But it, I think it, it tends to open people up because you're already doing it with a generosity. Um, it's, not that, it's not that we would, we would then just do exactly what they said they needed because we might think what they needed wasn't interesting for us. So it wasn't like a done deal that you, you tell us the answer and then that, that's what we do. It would be to start to work on defining a brief with that, with that other person. So, and which, would, which is an open, complex conversation. You know, it's not just like that's, that's done and we had a form of how, of how to do it. But, um, sorry, Gal the gallery's getting turned on. <laughs> um, so defining a brief, which is, which is also, I think that perhaps has become, maybe it's become more a standard thing now, but it also felt like that was so oppositional to what the art world was doing and how artists were working in the 90s and the early 2000s. It was sort of the opposite of trying to define a brief that felt like an imposition. But I was actually interested in trying to step outside of the subjectivity of art making into an, ob an objective approach. And we thought actually defining a brief really helped you to, to look at ideas of objectivity. I still, I'm not sure that we're being objective, but it allows you to refine and justify and argue and develop um, a response to, to somebody else. And I still think it's, it's a very interesting format for how, how to approach things. So the next point was ask a question. So with the multicultural, organization what is multicultural became a genuine question that as we had conversations with all of the organization they nobody could define what multicultural meant and we felt that that was a real flaw in them in themselves being a multicultural organization and so we just we just offered to say that's something that we could support you with let's look at how do we define what multiculturalism means for you and how that becomes a stronger part of what, what you do as an organi organization. And I think in this period of 2002, 2003, uh, uh, the, the sort of questioning processes were very key to a whole range of projects that I was working on um, as a curatorial methodology and an art, an, an, art, an art practice. So pursuing conversation was the next, that it was about engaging, being with groups, being with people, finding out, beyond the first the first response what happens when you delve in deeper and deeper and deeper so the you know they all, i mean they all sound really simple <laughs> they're very simple none of these are complicated things in themselves they are all fairly obvious things that you might do in various points but actually for us they became a sort of guide that we could work through and say have we have we done this how will how is this useful for the project so we realized that building archives 
was very useful in all of the situations and came out of Celine's practice um, as much as 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 mine. As I mean, I suppose in my my way of building an archive within Eastside projects is, for example, here the the pink pattern on the wall behind the book or the Samara Scott artwork in the concrete floor is a type of archive that we're developing in Eastside projects. It's called long-term artworks. And it's about the ebb and flow and the changing time signatures of how you engage with art. So that, you know, if you, if you um, I mean, in a way, it was, it was sort of interesting what the, the guy said about, um, at the end of his talk, the provocation about um, uh, the sort of naivety of imagining that putting objects in the gallery is research is, um, it, it, in a way, we sort of tried to deal with that early on in 2008 to say, if you run a gallery, how does it, how does it, how does it learn? How does it change? How does it evolve? How does it develop knowledge? Not through language, not through writing, not through peer reviewing, but through the physicality and the collaborative reauthoring of a physical space over and over again. So that's, that's the sort of pursue conversation of building an archive. So it might be that we make an archive within ESO, ESO projects that is about a developing library or is an archive of material that we collect over time that comes out of the processes. But for me, the long-term artworks is probably the key area. And I think navigating the terrain was something early on. As soon as we got out of the gallery space as well, we realized they're the same. A gallery is the same as this view up the street opposite the gallery to the viaduct that was built by Brunel but was never used for a, by a train ever and is a virgin bit of land that the public has never been able to view the city from. And, I, and so, so when I'm here I would learn how do I get the keys? How do I get onto that viaduct? How do I get that view that no one has ever had before? How do you, how do you engage with that, with that terrain? And who has built it? Who has decided those things? Which actually, all of those questions make as much sense for a gallery as they do for a landscape. A gallery is just an, another type of landscape. And I, I mean, and I mean that in the broadest sense of being a political landscape. Um, so that was one which we, we took, as we were doing other projects like Essex University Campus and trying to look at, they wanted us to celebrate their 50th anniversary of the campus or 40th anniversary. How did we, how did we understand the landscape? How did we um, create something that fitted into their into their terrain that added and contributed to it and taught taught to the history, taught to, to, to the applications? Um, and so, constructing a framework was the next. So, um, and that might mean a physical framework. It might just be an organisational, a programming framework. Um, or just a set of relationships, you know, it's quite an open, um, and we were interested in, in physical structures which, which show, which reveal aspects about uh, the, the, the surrounding context. So here you've got a, me a metal grid, which me and Celine built for the front of Eastside projects, and on it we placed a billboard, and then we made this exactly the same size scaffolding wall on the inside of the gallery and an internal billboard, and that was really because of the language of the streets around us in Digbeth, um, which were had been bought by developers who were waiting, kind of sleeping on them, and uh, until price uh, land prices rose, which of course they have now because of HS2 coming in, amongst other things, and they 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 try to make bit they make make money out of the land in the meantime, which often means car parking and billboards. So there are two ways that you just bring in money without really having to do anything. So we would use that language, but try and co-opt it and change the conditions of what is presented and what is displayed through a billboard system um, and sort of play off ideas of curtain walls and ar architectural forms. And then really importantly was claim, claim a position. So, I mean, in a way I, st I started this by claiming a position saying that, you know, we, we confronted and presented an idea of what support structure was as an art form and that is claiming a position so it, and, and you sort of need to do that within each project as well what where are we going to stand and how do we claim our space within it what was interesting for this project was that i i raised the funds for it and then we we approached the organizations so we didn't we weren't hired by the organizations in effect, we were sort of doing it the other way around. We were hiring the organizations to be our context for us. And that was also claiming space for us, not to be dependent upon them, but to be parallel 
with with their with their practice as well. Um, then, as you get to the end of the methodology, there's a sense of checking where you've been and what and what haven't you considered, and you know, have you thought about all of the different elements? Yeah, and playing a game was an idea of doing that. Play a game to shift your mindset to put a process through a different point of view. Um, to have a different reason to, to do something. So for example, in the, in the very first iteration at Chisholm Hale, one of the um, boxes had a set of board games with it, within that space and people play cricket in the gallery and things like that. So some curators would come in and pick up the game playing element and turn that into a process that they would engage with over time. And then we also had evaluate your tools in which sort of feels like I'm, it feels a little bit dry and, and dull to me in a way, <laughs> but it's felt, it felt exciting and wrong <laughs> to do it at the time, like 20 years ago. Um, but it, it's still, I mean, it's obviously a really important <laughs> aspect of it. So here, I just thought, I mean, as I was walking around the gallery, taking these photos with, with the second version of the book, I kind of thinking about this, I've placed the book next to the mobile wall unit and the mobile wall is one of the tools that we've uh, that I've researched and developed and and evolved within the program of of Eastside Projects activity, and it's a matter of an, an exhibition is a way of evaluating something like that as well, of reusing it and testing it out over and over. And then the final one, which so in a way the final the last three are very much about reflective and willful acts so the choosing an, an acceptable color was to remind ourselves and those that we work with that we we would be willful and impulsive so much as we had tried to by defining the brief and setting up a methodology in the first place look like we are being objective and we're running through a scheme and a program we saw this as a very creative open guide that we would interpret and apply in a very you know completely open way it's just that the structure itself would buy us freedom so i think and i think it's a really important thing for looking at particularly the relationship between the practice and practice as research and the research structures and forms that are there if within a research practice there are forms which limit and control and slow you down and stress you out and make that research more difficult then that's a bad structure and you need to replace that and you need to you need to find structures which actually open out expand increase the possibilities of what of what can be done right so how, how long have i been going i can't actually see a timer here you're, you're fine gavin you've got okay. uh we have about half an hour so if you aim for 10 10 more minutes i'll skip, a I'll skip through these break. fairly quickly then okay there's no cool. need to rush gavin please take your time yeah. thanks anthony so this was just a little another version of the question form that if you go somewhere um work out you know speak speak the language find out but actually questioning questions are an amazing process to find very fundamental underlying things about um, the area where you are so when i was when i was working in china i would try translated had the, the 40 questions uh, these 40 questions translated and would offer that as an as a as a meeting card with people and invite artists and curators to to tell me which questions they thought were most interesting for them within the context in guangzhou and that and that led to a whole range of very long-term relationships, projects, publications, events. So th this, is a, this is a parallel project that also started in 2002. It's called St Strategic Questions. It's a set of 40 questions written by Buckminster Fuller, the American um, design scientist, um, engineer, artist in a way. I, I'm interested in him as a model for an artist, although he would never have called himself an artist. Um, and these 40 questions you need to know the answers to if you want to solve all the world's problems. So I decided to, to set out to make 40 publications with, with, with other artists to answer the questions that, um, through artworks. And I've, pu I've published 27 so far since 2002. So there's still quite a few to do, but I'll try and get there. So this was number 26, what is animate? And this is, a, this is the parallel one, which is mentioned in the title about link and shift. Um, it's a project that I made with Alec Finley and I met the master poet Paul Keneally, who I continue to collaborate with. 
and it was a Birmingham City Council commission for uh, an area of South Birmingham where I, where I live that was to be re regenerated. And I was in, and I sort of, my pitch to the council was, I'm fed up of doing projects in China or all around the world and everywhere else. Why don't I ever get asked to do a project where I live on my doorstep? And the council officer was like, actually, there are some projects. Would you like to propose something? And so I proposed to do a year long, um, a year long poem to write with people on the estates of Kings Norton. And I, I did that because I'd come across this process of writing, which is called Renga, um, which is, is based on a, a Japanese writing system, it's like a thousand, thousand plus years old writing system, um, which you would, you may, if you don't know the term Renga, you would, you would know the, the phrases haiku or senru, and um, they are, they are exquisite writing systems. They are shared writing systems and they use incredible processes which are um, non-linear generative um, narrative processes. Very, 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 very interesting. And so I set out to learn how to write like this. Uh, I had sort of try, dabbled a little bit. I'd seen Alec Finley working with, with the form. And then, uh, so I asked Alec to devise a project with me for this site. And we, we would do this, we would turn up in the public square and we would set out some bean bags and have, I'd provide some food. I, I, my official title was host poet. And uh, the gentleman in the hat here is Paul Keneally, who was master poet. And we'd invite people in and Paul would, would teach us and train us and lead us and we'd all write together and we'd eat and we'd drink and we'd spend a whole day writing. And it was planned that we would spend six or seven days across a year through all four seasons. Um, and then we, we began to write. Uh, so this is the, fir the first day. And these are the people who turned up who were just like from an old woman who was walking around and didn't really have anything to do and sat down with us for, and then joined for every single meeting throughout all the whole project to a young rapper called Diesel who just was sort of walking by with his mates and then joined in because he was really interested in writing his, his raps. And so he, so it, and it sort of, it was very ad hoc, open, invitational. And then word got out and more people came and joined in over time. So the format is, uh, the first verse is written by the, by the master poet and presented, which is bright sunshine, a shepherd gathers his flock into the fold. Mm -hmm. And then now if we were all writing it together, I would invite all of everyone to write a second verse that would respond to the first verse. And you would write two lines. So it has to link, but it begins to shift away. And so by the time you get to the third verse, there can be no links back to the first verse at all. So it means you have to move to different places, talk from different positions, be different people, have different viewpoints, be in different times. You can, you, it can be something that's happening around you. It can be a scent or a feeling or a, you know, an emotion or the light. Um, and, it can, and it speaks of the place. So this was the idea that we, we develop a public artwork which speaks of Kings Norton in a way that hasn't been spoken before and develop that process. So I, I find it a really fascinating um, process of linking to something before and shifting away from it and then shifting away again and then shifting away again. And so as the more you experience you become, you realize even within 10 verses, you, you wouldn't have the same subject or the same word. Um, you, you sort of learn and you pick up rhythms and then you try and make sure that you don't get trapped in rhythms. And we applied some of the poems across the council estates. I sort of took over abandoned signs and just um, presented some of the verses as they happened, which also promoted the next time that we were going to meet up. So it was available on that site. And in the end, um, a book was made of the 100 verses. Uh, a film was made as well afterwards, but the 100 verses book was just given away free through the local library, through launch events. Um, and it became, it was a, re it was a really, interesting tool and, and about 60 people wrote the book um, alongside myself and Paul and Alec. So it was a very um, enriching experience and even through that process we kind of evolved it as it went. So we've suddenly realized what is public space in this area and I think that's where you start to ask the questions and say okay we'll do a day in a pub in a public house and then what where else on the estate haven't we done it? We haven't done it 
in this other massive amount of space on that other estates which is which is the front rooms and interiors of people's houses so we met somebody and they welcomed us and said we could write inside their house they also used it as a business opportunity to try and promote their their prize draw mini company that they were doing this is uh, keith keith who welcome us, welcoming us all into his house which is also very fitting that um in in the 1600s 1700s if you were having a business meeting you would probably invite a renga poet to come to that meeting and the more the more important that renga poet the more powerful you were as a business person and during business negotiations you would write poetry together and the master poet would lead that process so another i mean it's a really incredible history if you look at um basho's writings or chioni's writings and their stories and their their kind of moving in and out of society within japan it is a, a fascinating history and fascinating forms and one which obviously you know influences greatly western culture as well so that's just a, a little aside to build it in i'm trying to trying to get to the ending here uh, i've already just well i started talking about east side projects now so this is east side project started in 2008 but some of those that sort of thinking of those previous projects really fed into east side projects and i guess here's where it becomes more multifaceted you know now we call ourselves an artist run multiverse because there is so much going on within an organization within the establishment of an organization and the relationships and projects so i think i probably won't have i won't have time to look at very much of this but just a sense of on the very first day we opened in 2008 this user's manual was made a draft number one of esi projects manual that told you how long it had taken to make the space, how, what the space was made of, and what our mission was that we have joined together to execute functional constructions and to alter or refurbish existing structures as a means of surviving in a capitalist economy. That's a, a direct take from um, one of our reference exhibitions, which is a, an exhibition at Peter Nadine gallery um, had in 1979 on Broadway in New York which was a cumulative exhibition program really fascinating project so we, we tried to ask um, questions about what if you're going to make an organization that that displays art and produces art and develops art what should that space be how do you learn from all the other types of um, attempts at, at doing that uh, in, in history and which bits do you leave out and which bits do you choose to build in and the manuals were a way of also presenting and showing that process and asking questions and uh, and working and working through it so we and we it wasn't you know it wasn't a gimmick it wasn't <laughs> it was just like a working process for us that we would then produce a more sophisticated manual or then we would change an idea of what of what it would be for I'm starting to just think that um, art spaces are quite complex the idea that you anybody can just stroll into one and just like get it there and then is just a weird idea like why is that such an interest why is that such a fascinating idea that, ev that anything in the world is so accessible that anybody can approach it i just think it takes much more work than that it takes much more effort than that and we wanted to make um something that took your time and demanded your involvement in it uh, and, and so for those who wanted to get involved in that way the user's manuals were there for you so it looked at situations it started to embed artworks that had been happening in the space into the gallery um, and we and we made more and more over time so this is actually draft four and over printed as draft five and we're beginning to ask a lot a lot of questions so here instead of the you know the 11 parts of our support structure methodology um, we've got this long list of words of verbs of things that we do at esi projects and quest you know, questioning maybe maybe one of them or commissioning provoking transforming staffing sequencing welcoming selling tweeting you know these are the actions that we do and then we would try and explain something about them make it make it useful we had a, a public evaluation event where we looked at some of those structures of what we were trying to achieve and then findings from the public evaluation event were then programmed back into the fifth version. So the blue elements are just the overprinting of the next version of the user's manual. Um, 
but already you know you can see there's there's a lot of stuff in there Th these are all available as pdfs on the eSide projects website as well every single user's manual is there so you can kind of scroll through and look at things you can present what what who you've worked with and what has happened um, and these and each one time we make it it sort of leads to another idea of how we can how we can prove something how we can print something what the process is of making it and working together and who we collaborate with um, and there's a little bit of Mel Jordan there on the hairdressing bit from so free were part of the um, public evaluation event and this was part from one of the texts that they that they wrote for that for that project so let's build an artwork in the image of the hairdresser so it's a, a way to make provocations and to present um, uh, new new thoughts about what is it that our organization should share should you share your budget should you show what you're spending it on and how much you're paying artists and how much you're spending on materials and and your energy usage and your code of conduct or the way that you treat people all these things are hidden in in you know almost all of the institutions in the in the world and we wanted to start sharing those things which now you know this this is um 2000 and 11 I think 2011 so we're trying to push that as a as an idea for others to share um, okay so then so that is a very quick I'm sorry about the speed of that but it just gives you a flavor I suppose of what um, an organization might do I want to just read through this user's manual it's, it's very quick it's a children's story so this is the sixth user's manual and we decided to make a very different format this is the coat of arms of Birmingham um, it just so happens that the coat of arms of Birmingham has an engineer and an artist on it, and it always has. So it's not it's not that old uh, coat of arms. It's probably only it's like 150 years old as a coat of arms. But it comes out of the history of Birmingham um, makers and the, the collaboration and overlap of people from the Lunar Society through to today. Um, so I will read through the story. The city wasn't always here. How did it become what it is today? The city is shaped by the hammer and the hammer's motto is forward. The hammer has two supporters. They are the artist and the engineer. Each day they put the city together. But at the end of each day, the hammer cries forward. And the hammer clears away the city. He buries and flattens. He makes a new foundation. The next day, the artist and the engineer put together a new city. One night, after the hammer has cleared the city, the engineer sees something left over, and the artist has an idea. The artist and the engineer imagine a new way of building with leftovers and layers. Can they persuade the hammer not to flatten the city? The artist says, we could build on top of, around, over, and through. And the engineer says, we could recycle and upcycle. The engineer says we could build a city with a memory. And the artist says to do this, we will need a new motto. They talk all night with the hammer. 1,000 ideas, 100 ideas, one idea. The next morning, they're ready to make their announcement to the city. The new motto for the city is layered. Welcome to our new layered city. The city records its own history. Nothing is forgotten. So we made that as a children's story and, and pitched this idea of layers. We invited the leader of Birmingham to come to the launch of the publication on our fifth birthday. And he really loved it and invited us to come and speak with him about rethinking Birmingham's identity. And that started a, an in, interesting relationship with different politicians and people in the city. So it seems like such a simple idea where we've just tried to explain what it is that Eastside Projects does. And we've applied it to the story of Birmingham and retold the story of Birmingham. And the fact that the leader of the city has a business card that has an artist on it. This, you know, these are things that are, are, are overlooked, not noticed. And all of a sudden we want to bring it into focus and change what that means. And the outcome of that is that we would make a program called Production Show and we invite artists to collaborate with engineers and we develop a production process that leads from pending, researching and concepting all the way through to evaluating, concluding and upcycling. 
So we're discovering, it's not a methodology per se, it's a production process, but it's a similar approach. You say, who and what is there? What are the inputs? What are the outputs? And, you, and we facilitate and support a process of artists and engineers working together. So that happened from 2016 through to 2018. And there were, there were exhibitions where you show prototypes, public artworks being made, beginnings of um, setting up an artist like Sonia Boyce working with a local skateboard uh, making company just around the corner. So everything was working in uh, locally in Birmingham and especially in Digbeth, in the area where we, where we are. And um, events would happen. So Sonia would then make a new skateboard and would create a performance situation where we invite skateboarders to come and use the gallery. And that would create a film and then another exhibition. So this is Sonia Boyce's solo show that I, that I curated with her last year. It's called In the Castle of My Skin and it's actually opening tomorrow, the next version of it at MIMA um, in Middlesbrough. And so the, form, the structural form is a development of the movement and the performance of the skateboarders within the gallery. And Sonia made a new two screen film work as part of that, that project. And it was, it became, it was our, I think it was our most visited exhibition and it, it was really loved and, and it, it was the exhibition that happened and when the pandemic um, started so it was kind of stopped and then reopened and then stopped again and, and, has, and has moved on but an incredible process through from a sequence of shows uh, working together and then one of the other outcomes is so really developing that production show process is, is I was working with, with Ruth Claxton. We're co-curating that process. And Ruth had done a lot of research on making a Birmingham production space. And that had uh, led to a collaboration with Birmingham City University, which ultimately has led to Steam House being made in Birmingham as a partnership between Eastside Projects and Birmingham City University. And there's now a new, um, a very large new, new building being made for the future Steam House. Um, towards the far east of the east side area. So it is very practical, physical outcomes, processes, options that are there, that are coming straight out of our inquiries, our questionings, our evaluations, our exhibition forms, that are then being applied again and, and, and again. And sometimes they're explored through other forms, like through, through books. And so here we have... Um, the up upcycle this book, which presents a, a lots of the findings from the process of working through Eastside projects. Um, so they're gathered in a variety of forms, but the one just, just to end where we've been trying to get to is this sort of long 20 year process of leading into an opportunity which happened uh, at the end of 2019. So we were in, invited by the architects, D David Conn architects in, in London, for myself and Celine and Ruth and the whole of Eastside Projects to work, work with them to develop a team for, um, to pitch an idea to Birmingham City Council and uh, Lendlease, the uh, very large developers who are taking on this huge area of land in the centre of Birmingham and, and a relocation of Birmingham Market. And so we pitched an idea. So this is how the city council see it. They see that this is the only time in our generation that there will be this amount of development happening directly in the center. So it's such a massive area. Um, so it's like a 1.5 billion development in total. What we were pitching for was, was for the 60 million pounds new market, which is just to the left. You can see at the bottom, um, uh, St. Martin's church and uh, the ball ring. And then just, in, just above St. Martin's Church is a very early mock-up of what the market might be. So we, um, we co we've collaborated with David Con Architects and we pitched an idea of a process. And the process is the artist and the engineer process. It is, a, is the production process. It involves the support structure methodologies. It involves um, some of the link and shift approaches. And we use that to pitch an idea of this is how our team will work and this is how we will design the new market of Birmingham. And it was a, it was a global competition and we, we won the competition with, the, with these um, documents, which I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, but basically an ingredients, a preparation and a feast. 
But I just wanted to show you this, that I just thought what, in that bit when we were suddenly going to have to pitch for the 60 million pound building and it was like the final version and the interview, I just thought it, need, it needed a poem. You know, all the forms that you think you will, you will use to make something happen. I thought, if I believe in this, then, and this is something that I think is a very special process and others will do so. And we, so I wrote a version of all of the technical information that we were trying to pitch for the project with. I wrote this, this phrasing here, which is, you know, a green, a green future, a landscape as a roof, demonstrating the heart of the city, a garden of learning, a future plan in action, granting freedom and overflowing with green to lift the city. Now, I'm breaking some of the Renga rules here to make it work, but, but I think that's also the spirit of it. You adapt, you adapt the, the system around you to make sure that, it, that it's really effective. Oops. Um, so there was uh, four poems that ran through this process and they were also given to the selection panel as individual poems for them to think about. And then we're also pitching at, at what, that, what that meant in reality, which is really about getting to know the people who make the market what it is, um, understanding the, the, the terrain and offering our support. And that is very powerful in that sort of situation where I think they're used to a certain type of architectural pitch, which isn't what we are offering. We're offering the experience and the research and the understandings of 12 years of running Eastside projects in the city and thinking about what Birmingham is, what it was and what it can be in the future. And we're saying, we want to directly apply all of those processes to this new market and find out which ones are useful for the people who want to continue to run their market stalls, who want to come and feed themselves or buy clothes or tools, you know, had to be a fundamental uh, ingredient of what makes up Birmingham. So, so, we, so we've, and we're just about to start the actual design process now, so we still haven't done that. That was announced a year ago, but the pandemic slowed the whole thing down. Um, and this was one of the final images, which just presented an insight and kind of sliced through lots of activity that's happening in Birmingham. And each one of these things is a real moment that has happened in, in Birmingham. So it gave, um, you know, our, our collaboration was, was really welcomed. And it was, and, and that early work on the artists and the engineer and relationships with politicians in the city also, came came through and so actually sharing the knowledge getting that understanding was really key to be able to take on a project like, like this so this is our, ne our next test it's uh, obviously I can't say we've done it yet and it all worked out fine <laughs> but I think it's a it's a in a way it's a very exciting project for us it's one of those um, you know potentially dream scenarios where we get to apply the ideas that we've developed in a gallery space, in an experimental situation, and apply it to become the new market for the next hundred years of Birmingham's life. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Kevin, thank you. Um, wonderful. Uh, on, a, on a personal level, seeing the development, it occurred to me as you were speaking that I first visited Eastside Projects in 2009. And in fact, and this is just an aside because we do have some questions from our attendees today. I recall bringing my students up from London and as you note, and I think most of our attendees will be familiar, uh, it's situated in Digbeth, which is not the most salubrious part of Birmingham, yeah. but it has a rich heritage, an extraordinary sort of landscape in and of itself. Um, and, and, and surrounded by at least then auto repair shops which i think some of which are still there but there's obviously been some development but i recall going into the building specifically and it immediately became apparent that this was an artist run space yeah. which again brings us back to methodologies what methodologies are being progressed through artistic practice how do we understand those methodologies and i recall quite succinctly and directly the gallery being presented as a communicative event mm -hmm. not something necessarily to reflect upon certainly not something you would grasp in its entirety by one visit or through one visit but as a communicative event which gives rise to a sort of interdisciplinary process which obviously the thread throughout everything that you've been speaking about up to and including the redevelopment of Smithfield has that interdisciplinary event, that communicative event built into it. 
And it's quite impressive, if I may say, and this is an aside before we turn to questions, to see how that has begun as an abstract theoretical practice, but very, very quickly became imbricated as the de facto practice out of which the theory was developing. And I say this because I think a lot of doctoral students struggle with the connect between the theoretical abstractions of research-based practice and the actuality, the impact, the social, the political, the environmental, the corporeal impact yeah. of practice itself on physical space, on the physical being walking through that space. But these are just asides. I have many questions, but we do, and I want to open to the floor, we do have a question from Rob Hamp, but I would just like uh, to ask if anybody else has a question that they want to jump in with, and then I can come to Rob, or indeed I will go direct to Rob and give people a chance to catch their breath. Uh, Rob, thank you for your question. Um, Gavin, I think you can see that in the chat bar. Yeah, I can see it. For the sake yeah. of all of our attendees. <clears throat> uh, so can I just respond to that? I'll read it so that everybody's on the same page, so to speak. Uh, cool. So, Gavin, thanks. Uh, do you think this is underpinned by Tutland's instructional, and I, I, I think he means, do you think this, the project, is underpinned by Tutland's instructional documentation of all used objects, and whether they were a supporter or supported element forward slash contributor? I'll pass it over to you because obviously what Rob's getting at here is a, a detail which is crucial to how you articulate this particular project. Yeah, um, it wasn't, it's not actually a phrasing that I've come across within Tatlin's, um, within Tatlin's work. So, but I think probably what it, what it is, is that it is, we, myself and Celine, really looked a lot at El Lazitsky's work, I mean, I think my, I mean, my own practice was early fascination was the, was all of the constructivists and they were and from suprematism into constructivism and beyond. So it's, it's an ongoing fascination. And I suppose without El Lazitsky, I feel like there was a lot of um, unfinished work, but we, some of the language that we use directly references Lazitsky. Lazitsky's abstract cabinet was one of the other key reference points that we, involved and continue to actually i'm just making a new kind of abstract cabinet version as a as a van that we can drive around and have exhibitions and gigs and things taking place inside um so it's it's not a done thing but it's i think it's definitely there um but then so whether they're supporter or supported I don't know. Must the roles reverse to create? I don't really know what that means. <laughs> well, but, but perhaps, you, Rob, you, we can pick this up later. But um, I think, obviously, to a certain extent, what we have here, Gavin, is process. What we mean by process, what we mean by practice. How do you quantify? How do you collaborate, quite simply? I mean, where yeah. do you position that emphasis? Institutional, practice, critical, curatorial? And where, where precisely does that lie? Um, <clears throat> I'll move on to our second question from Lisa Demmel. <coughs> I'll read this again, Gavin. With regard to ESAC projects, could you elaborate on how the user's manual and code of, conduct, <laughs> code of conduct translate into an institutional structure, i.e. theme composition, funding sources, and also ways, levels of accountability, holding people accountable, holding the institution accountable? Mm. I'll leave it at that, actually, because there's yeah. a second part of that question, but perhaps you could answer the first, or at least approach the first part of that question, please, Gavin. Yeah, they come, I mean, it, they come out of the, the team and institutional structure, and sometimes they, they proceed and adapt changes. Um, mm -hmm. It is, it's a small team, there's six people, so it's not like there's a, it's not like it's a huge team. It's very much led by myself and Ruth Claxton. We are two of the company directors of Eastside Projects as well. Originally, there were there were six of, of which Celine Condorelli was also one of the founders. Um, and then we we created an, an advisory board. So we have an advisory board, but it it maintains that the artists um, are the lead of that and have the legal power. Mm. of the situation so we don't hand it over to non-artists as trustees um, we try and keep it very simple and direct 
Um, and then we have we have two other slightly more sort of senior posts, off offsite curator and uh, EOP programmer, pub public programmer. And then we have two artist curator trainee posts. So which we hoping we'll, we'll be expanding on that once the Smithfield Market project starts, we'll be expanding the team to, depending on capacity needs for particular projects. But it is, you know, it's led by our, our artistic vision and then within that, it's very much about getting the team together, co-curating programs. So the artist curators are co-curating the next main gallery exhibition with us. They're curating their own shows later on next year. It's it's trying to involve everyone in as in as many aspects as possible, I suppose. But there but the, there is there are some pragmatic details where there is separation, and there is times when you know weight and stress falls on. Uh, mine or Ruth's shoulders for how that comes together so but then that's you know that's what we did it for as well we're, we're interested in in making creating structures but, uh, yeah so hopefully that makes sense it connects up on a purely selfish note I would assume as part of the funding that you will receive and I'm speaking with my BCU hat on Gavin that we should talk more about doctoral training programs and course development of uh, doctorates which I would assume down the line, especially with M4C, this looks, dare I say, handmade as a project to tackle precisely the issues we have set out to address today. How does research play out in the cultural sector and what is the relationship between that and higher educational institutions? How do we articulate that in terms of impact? Yeah. How do we ultimately understand that in terms of its long-term output? Yeah, um, so I think that, so I just say to me quickly about that because I think that's, it's a key thing that ESI projects wouldn't have come into being without the support of the university and the and in a way a kind of collaborative viewpoint with Arts Council to try and support a new type of artist run organization in the city mm. and I think that's a model that could be replicated again but it has been an ongoing you know throughout the entirety of ESI projects it's been a partnership with Birmingham City University for most of that time I've been a research fellow as well so that there are lot of opportunities for that crossover and I think that you're right Anthony there's probably there's always more there's always the next and at the moment it's the logic for it is stronger than ever because of the projects like Smithfield or other very big scale events that are happening in the Midlands over the next few years mm -hmm. that we are um, really well positioned for so for example we're also doing the public art program for HS2 interchange station that's just one of the other big scale um, connections that we have in the area it also seems like a perfect opportunity, and again, I'm speaking with my BCU hat, but this is open to our attendees because what we're here today to discuss is what the relationship is between higher educational institutions, right. corporate yeah. interests, cultural sector, yeah. and indeed the broader sense of society. And again, Gavin, one of the things that comes across, and I think this is something that you and I have been speaking about and will continue to explore, how do you use a project such as this to re-articulate the urgencies of practice against and in conjunction with institutional demands. Is there a middle ground or do we literally need to reinstitute practice, reconsider practice from the ground up yeah. from an artistic perspective as opposed to from the sky down so to speak? Yeah. In uh, some ways I think that's sure. I think that's important because I mean that's why Steamhouse has been interesting because it did come from the ground up. It came from us, came from a need. The fact that there isn't a production space for artists who want to make larger scale work in this city, in the second biggest city in the country, is not there's, there's not much of a facility. So the idea of the university being able to work alongside our thinking to develop something like that is this real opportunity. But I think it's very important to to ensure that that, is, that that is part of the ethos of a university as an institution. Because if, this, if the ethos gets switched around and suddenly it's decided that the ground up knowledge and research isn't the most important thing about how the university can act, then the right. university merely acts as a corporation and merely acts as, um, as, an, as an institution to, to maintain itself for monetary reasons. So it needs to maintain itself for genuine ideas which have been developed by the people who are making the university work. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in a way, we, I could say that that's happened with us at Eastside Projects. We have been supported in that way and given that 
freedom to genuinely explore what it means to make art and why art is useful in this city. You know, so that's... Well, I think... Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, Gavin. Um, I, see, I think we're seeing the outcome of that presently in this new project. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to truncate this. We have run over time. I'm conscious that we're back at two o'clock with a keynote by Emily Pringle, head of research at Tate, which I think will take us in a different direction to what Gavin has been talking about, but obviously the same considerations that prefaced Michael Schwab's talk and indeed Carolina and my introduction will be prevalent. So thank you folks. Thank you, Janine. Thank you, Madalena. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Erda Lisa, Lisa Demo. <laughs> Thank you, Rob, for your question. I'm sure you can pick that up with uh, Gavin at any point. Thank you, Jesse and Leonor. Thank you for your support. Finally, Gavin. My pleasure. I look forward to picking matters up with you soon, sir. Yes? Yeah, great. Good Take to care, see you. Gavin. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Folks. Take yeah. care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.